Good morning. We'll, we welcome you to this information session. For those of you that have come to the call for this mute metaverse community, a brief message in English and Portuguese. Okay, now we will begin in this session in which we want to cover three main objectives. We will be speaking on metaverse, augmented reality, virtual reality, but we want to do it from an ethical perspective and understand what the implications, the social and ethical implications that we must bear in mind are. We also want to know about some of the examples of how in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean today, the metaverse is being used as well as all these new realities to provide a positive social change and also a very important thing is that we will explain what the characteristics of this call are what each one and every one of you need to know in order to be able to participate in it and to explain all the doubts that may still be pending we have maria elena and diana good morning and hopefully you'll answer the questions So some of the questions will be answered here during the session. Others will be answered through the chat, thanks to our team. Um, others will be answered via email later on. So before we begin, it's good to introduce you to the three um, protagonists of this initiative. First, we have the two organizers. On one hand, Meta, which is a company that surely does not require any presentation. I think that everyone today in our mobile devices. We use their apps every single day, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp. And it's a company that is so convinced and so firmly believes in the possibilities of virtual reality and augmented reality that have put Metaverse in their own DNA, in their name. Second, the second one is the co-organizer of this initiative, which is IDB Lab, the innovation lab, the ideas laboratory of the idp group which is the main source of funding for development projects in latin america and the caribbean and they work with the mission which is to improve lives in our region and the third main character are you the communities the associations ngos startups companies that are now working in the metaverse or that have an idea and you think that maybe it could be useful to use the metaverse and those technologies of augmented reality, mixed reality with a positive effect, a positive impact on the region. And if that is your focus, this session is for you. Why do we think that it's important to have an initiative such as this? I'm going to try to explain this very briefly. The technological transformation has accompanied humanity in each one of its phases during each one of these times. There have been many technologies. Some have gone, have come and gone without any notice, and some have really changed our lives to the point in which today we can no longer understand our culture, our society, our way of life without recognizing the impact that technologies have had in many aspects on how we move, how we communicate, even what things we can eat, how we learn. Technology permeates everything, and now we're in a moment of history with very accelerated changes with the technological revolution as, no, as has never been seen before. So we see a universe of new possibilities of virtual reality, of augmented reality, and the challenge that we have as a society and the challenge that Meta and IDB Lab are presenting are how to take advantage of all these opportunities in a positive way, in an ethical and socially responsible way. How can we make that impact inclusive? and not leave anyone behind, especially in a region such as ours, Latin America and the Caribbean, that continues to accumulate one of the major social and equality differences in the world. This is the challenge that we're going to be talking about during these 60 minutes. And I've already talked too much, so now we're gonna hear our, our experts. And we'll start with a few welcoming words with greetings by the leaders of the two organizations that promote this initiative. By Meta, we will have Pedro Les Andrade, who is the Vice President of Public Policies for Latin America. And by IDB Lab, we will hear Irene Ayes-Hoffman, Hoffman, is the CEO of IDB Lab. 
So Pedro, Irene, good morning. Also for promoting this initiative that we will be discussing and well there's an aspect that is key in this initiative, which is that ethical focus that social focus and the use that we can draw from the metaverse and well we'd like to we have a brief introduction by one of the authorities in this field in our region, which is Elena Sadiu, the CEO of the Center I for the Society of the Future that is very knowledgeable of these 
matters and will give us some key ideas that we have to learn and all understand so that that use of the metaverse can actually be ethical and sustainable. Elena, good morning. You have the floor. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with and in, in, in order to contribute in whatever way I can in this wonderful effort to promote the use of the metaverse with ethical purpose and with a positive impact on society. I'm going to give you a very, very brief introduction to what the metaverse metaverse is and this ethical this ethical impact because we talk about these aspects that are very rich in the metaverse. So let's go into it. Okay, what is the metaverse about? Well, we can see this from different points of view. There are concepts, but some are not new. We can see them as a natural evolution of the interaction that we've had in the entire digital space, because we also know the digital, the immersive digital experiences. They are not entirely new, but we are in a phase of explosive advance of technology where these experience experiences are definitely changing the way in which we in which we live or approach or come closer to these spaces now together with this very very rapid and exponential uh, technological advance and development many things occur in the metaverse and these immersive experiences that go faster than what we've been able to anticipate. And that is why we should analyze how we can have incidents on this metaverse for it to be responsible, ethical, and inclusive. And I'll give you an example of many that we've seen where a user had an experience in which she, she suffered a sexual abuse in the metaverse and that left some of us very left us astonished but these are not the only experiences there was rapidly a reaction but the important thing here is to to analyze to think about this and to prepare ourselves so that these spaces can be inclusive and where we can all participate and for everyone to be able to benefit from this. And here I bring you a series of questions. I love to ask questions. And I think that the best way to learn and, and analyze is if in the metaverse, what is prohibited in the physical world will also be illegal. And here we start with a very important point, which is that human rights do not change, regardless of where we are, whether it's a physical experience, an immersive one, we all continue to have the same rights. Now, what happens? And the interpretation, the protection mechanisms that exist in the world are different, depending on the country where we are. And even there are even countries where the frameworks are different among states in the same country. So we start to ask ourselves, what rules are going to prevail in these spaces? The rules of what countries? Who is going to dictate or, or establish these these rules. And there are going to be some that are common, who's going to decide them, who's going to interpret them, who will be making the decisions. Now, in the metaverse, in the metaverse, everything is everything allowed because it's not real. And this is something that we also have to ask ourselves, what is real? Is the physical part real? Or are these just different ways of experiencing, experiencing reality? And here, we see that there are areas for fishing, for sports activities, where we can enjoy these activities without affecting the ecosystem or hurting animals. We can have virtual bullfights with the same effect of not causing pain to any animal. Now, this is something that we should also ask ourselves if cruelty to animal avatars can reinforce sociopathic, antisocial behaviors can reinforce this way of exerting cruelty by human beings. And that is where this ethical part comes into play regarding reality and its consequences. If reproducing this type of activity can reinforce the 
aggressiveness that we already know in the analogical world and the physical world, we also have to, aside from asking ourselves these questions, we have to be prepared because these are new pathways to, to spread fake news as occurs on social media and as used to happen before in the traditional media. There's also a way to have occult hidden identities to use false profiles so that we don't really know who we're interacting with in the metaverse. And here we also have these matters that we do have to think about as to how to manage ourselves, how to go about these spaces. Now, this interaction with bots, with avatars, with false or fake avatars, and when I say this, it, I mean that there's not an identifiable person behind this. We also have some ethical questions, and here I'm showing some examples or questions. Can we interact with, with fake avatars that simulate sex with minors? Will prostitution will be allowed with avatars of real people or, or that are being impersonated or absolutely fictitious, completely made up? Can we create false avatars to physically or sexually abuse them without any type of consequence? Or can there be slavery of avatars? All these questions are important also to, and, and we need to include them in this creation of the metaverses. Also, we have to be very careful because this new creation has to help us to rethink about biases and, and what exists in our physical world and prejudice to not re automatically reproduce them because we have the tools to reconsider and rebalance in this world that we are designing to begin from another approach of equality and non-discrimination. And if we don't do it in this ethical way, we could be generating new cohorts of assistance. And here, just simply to exemplify, Alexa's, Cortana's, Ceres with sweet feminine voices, slender bodies that can reinforce our prejudice on the physical appearance, youth, and gender. So we have to analyze the situation of our avatars and what impacts this can have on racial prejudices and the aspects of individuals. We can eliminate wrinkles, uh, weight, lighten our skin. So we can also be reinforcing these ideas on the physical appearance of people and that have to do with racial prejudice of physical appearance, age prejudice. So maybe we can present metaverses that don't replicate this. Or we can all, but we should do it in a deliberate and, and conscientious way. We can also have explicit purposes to develop metaverse versus for, for peace, for coexistence. And here I'm just, you know, tossing out some ideas because these immersive realities can serve to experiment freedoms that many people don't have in the physical world. Let's think, for example, of women that live in places where they're Freedom is is, jeopard, is is jeopardized, is endangered. And here they could have the possibility to freely move in different spaces. Journalists can interview in, in, in more in safer areas for the people with different mobility problems, different capacities. They can have spaces to move without these restrictions and also have metaverses where there's uh, translation, subtitling, audio, all these things for different disabilities that exist in the, in, in, in the world and in the market. And this is very valuable. But the question is, how can we make these spaces accessible, safe, private, and more importantly, 
without exposing or causing any risk to vulnerable groups or to these specific groups, for example, journalists that assume risks in their work every day. How can we make these spaces available so that they could make use of their of their freedom, but take care of their privacy so that we don't expose them to even greater risks than what they already face in the physical world. And here we'll simply just ending by saying that we have to be very aware. Metaverse, it'll it'll surpass us, it'll go beyond us. And and this is an environment that will be developed in a very explosive way. We have to ask or answer ourselves these questions. We have to present the metaverse and consider it with these with these questions this exercise of calls are very very enriching so that we can address these questions and these different ways of of approaching the metaverse with a lot of responsibility thank you very much thank you very much elena this is an excellent presentation that has has helped us to present this sense of responsibility and this great opportunity that we have ahead of us on how we can use it in a very positive way, which is what we're seeking with this initiative. At the beginning, we said that we also wanted to show some examples because in the region, things are already being done today that are very interesting. Technology affects every area of our lives we've chosen to, maybe that are maybe particularly interesting. One is education and the second are smart cities. We're going to start with the educational aspects. We are accompanied by Jennifer Samaniego, who is an educational innovation analyst in the Technical Private University of Loja in Ecuador. She's responsible for the Virtual Reality Club of UTPL and leader of immersive learning uh, education in, in the university, master's from the University of Catalonia, of Catalonia. So we'd like to ask you a few questions. Starting with the educational experiences in Latin America and the Caribbean, and how, as of the pandemic, these perceptions on the possibilities of what can be done, what those inclusive spaces are using the metaverse. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation, for giving us this space, and for allowing us to tell you what we're doing in education in Latin America. As has been said, there are some initiatives that already exist with metaverses that are being created and there are generating spaces. There are some like the one of Chile, several in Peru for mining processes. In Colombia, there's a system that is called Waterboard that generates virtual environments in different areas of education, Lego type. There are others in Argentina, VR. Uh, in Mexico, there is also uh, a metaverse that is being created, but I also want to focus on projects led by higher education institutions where we have experimented in several areas. For example, in the Technical Private University of Loja, we've done virtual autopsies with different types of, of, of deaths right from the comfort of our homes for students that, that study uh, legal medical forensics and they can explore these, these deaths, these bodies without having to go physically to a forensic uh, lab. And I can also have access to these environments without necessarily being in an actual set. Simulations of hearings, access to biochemical practices, qualified labor. There are also many programs that are now helping in the field of education for technological institutes. There's a program called Activide. We're currently in collaboration with the private sector. They are creating laboratories for training of future technicians in automotive mechanics, automobile mechanics, which was very complicated to have all the necessary equipment to train these these individuals now they're doing it in the technological institute of cotopaxi there are other institutions that are working on this catholic university in a lab to train future electronic technicians that work with tension lines and these are very risky fields that um that require adequate training uh, biology forensics but aside from these lines of science as such there's another area that is already being sought in the university, such as the Polytechnic University. They work on a project to revitalize and also develop awareness of the of La Prosperina, 
uh, forest where we're working with children, 10 and 12 year old children. And what we want is that while they play, they can learn from the qualities and all the richness, all the wealth of the forests, as well as the best practices to be able to protect them and continue to maintain them. I think that there are many uh, examples. These are only a few of what is being done in Latin America. We are also working in matters of tourism and application so that future tour guides can use them and provide additional information. Also in museums so that they can have different applications to even revitalize culture, to be able to learn about our roots in Latin America, to work with with apps for augmented reality in indigenous and aboriginal uh, peoples of Ecuador so that we can all learn about our roots and mainly work with our children and teenagers so that they can know what our roots are and this that is now being lost, for example, how they could learn about their, their language, the, their clothing and, and save, rescue our culture. These are things that we're trying to address from the universities and provide support to the community and also generate spaces that will transform this, this teaching and learning process in our classrooms. Thank you, Jennifer. And something that I'm wondering is these new technologies, this new reality, can it actually help us learn better with more personalized experiences more tailored to the needs of each one of the individuals? Yes, that's correct. This is the challenge that we have to be able to develop a personalized environment or tailored to the needs of each institution. And that's why it is so important to begin to develop spaces and applications that can be shared and repositories that are developed with educational 3D systems and for teachers to use them and adapt them to their needs. And, and they are always tied to a special application and they have to use it as is, but these things should be adaptable to our classroom needs. And that's why the opportunities that have been created, the network of immersive learning in Ecuador, that's our goal, our line of work to be able to contribute from each university or from each institution to the different schools or, or high schools so they could use this technology in an open way and can adapt them to their needs. Excellent. One last very brief question. You've mentioned some examples on how this is being used. These initiatives are being used in higher education. Can this be transferred to, for example, spaces such as elementary and high school? Yes, some of the examples that I mentioned, such as the cell, the human body, the organs, the anatomical um, studies, these can be applied in elementary and high school. And these are apps that are already open and can be used and free can be used in schools and high schools, but, that's, but we don't stop there. We're also looking for other environments where we can help reinforce pedagogical uh, methodologies that due to the pandemic, we know that there are some things that in schools and high schools we need to address. And that is where the education, higher education institutions are joining efforts to reach these different areas, these different ramifications so that schools and high schools can apply this in the different areas where they have this need to reinforce this with the students. And many times this reinforcement continues in Zoom, but with these virtual immersive environments, we can take different, we can transform our classrooms. Thank you. Now we also want to take stock of another perspective, which is that of sustainable cities. And we have with us Lucia Bellocchio, who is the founder and director, executive director of Trend Smart Cities, uh, which is a consultancy specialized in smart cities, working on all the different angles at urban development, at sustainable mobility, and so on with the private sector, the public sector, with all of the different actors. She's very passionate about the sustainable cities issues. And so we'd like it if you could tell us a bit about how one can use the metaverse to improve the urban development of our cities so that the, so as to improve the countries, the cities, and the lives of all of the citizens. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you in this uh, event. And in response to your question, I would say that it's important to visualize how 
technologies have shown us today that they are indeed allies for improving our environments. I think it suffices for us to think of the tools with which we ha in uh, interact throughout the day that help us move about our cities, uh, that help us plan out a route, for example, to get somewhere, even to uh, buy things or to work. And so this uh, smart city approach that I've been working on and with the uh, uh, organic evolution of cities with cameras, sensors, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, all applied to urban management. Well, these end up being at some point in time, a reflection because that's what cities are. They are a reflection of person's lives and cities have to give uh, responses, has to have to give us answers to what's happening. And so digital experiences evolve and they are evolving to immersive experiences, that is to say, enriched by this sensation of a much more real presence, uh, ultra uh, realistic expressions. And what often happens is that we know places without having ever been there because of all the tools that technology provides us. And so there are now, cities that are working on tapping into all these opportunities and these are beginning to be called metaverse cities. There are cities such as Navarre uh, in Catalonia, in Barbados in the Latin American region and others that have acquired virtual uh, terrain or virtual lot so as to be part of a city government or an embassy. And so there are any number of opportunities in our region if we need to further explore how we can use these technologies as part of the strategic vision of the public sector so that cities can become innovative cities. This helps to draw talent, immersion, to retain talent in the form of young professionals. And it also helps cities have a much more fluid dialogue and to be able to get to know what is happening elsewhere, oftentimes without having to go there. So there are any number of opportunities. And I believe that these virtual experiences, which uh, to a greater or lesser extent are already part of our reality, have a real impact on our physical cities. That is to say, it's increasingly difficult to draw a clear line between the physical world and the digital world. That's why now, uh, we begin to hear talk of extended society where the virtual aspect it presents itself as an extension of our physical life. It enriches our experiences, expands them uh, thanks to uh, uh, spatial communication. There are many more uh, movements and expressions uh, rather than these being replaced as is often feared. So we can see very quite specific examples being able to buy some project to get our education, do our work online, engage in a transaction with our cities or our local governments. It has an impact, for example, in how we move about the city. It could reduce traffic. For example, we might not, we're not using a uh, mode of transportation that uh, emits CO2. We save time, money. It even has an impact on the logistics and distribution of goods in our cities. So I think that all of these experiences have a very real impact uh, in the physical world, in the cities in which we all live. Great. And one concept that often comes up when one speaks of metaverse and smart cities, one talks about the concept of digital twins. Now, what is that exactly? What should we know about this concept? Well, that is the trend of the moment in terms of planning, urban planning, and urban visualization. Basically, these are virtual replicas, digital replicas of whole cities or parts of a city, such as, for example, an airport, a building, transportation system of a city. And they have the particularity of integrating historical data that have been compiled with real-time data. And the truth is the application is as vast as our imagination and as vast as the needs of the city for it's being used in transportation, energy efficiency, to reduce the carbon footprint, to keep tabs of passengers at an airport, in the metro, or in the bus system in a city, 
So they've become a truly valuable planning, urban planning instrument precisely because of this, because it enables us to uh, do testing, to predict, to uh, conduct simulations, to study and analyze urban flows without even touching the physical world. So it's a, a digital way to ensure that it, it doesn't entail so many uh, difficulties. And once we're sure of all this, we can carry it over to the physical world. So it enables us to make better decisions based on data, evidence-based, that would enable us to plan in a much more assertive and precise fashion, answering to the real needs of those of us who live in cities. So once again, technologies such as these, can, well, we can't think about them only as lying in the digital spectrum because they clearly have an impact in the real world in the cities in which we live. And here, I believe Latin America and the Caribbean has a great opportunity thinking about the structural problems that we often encounter in urban areas, informal settlements, and systems of mobility and transportation that uh, stand to benefit a great deal from these kinds, uh, kinds of uh, technologies. I see. So we, there's this back and forth between the physical reality and the virtual uh, reality. Now, if I don't know if in 30 seconds you could give us a couple of examples of applications that we should have on our radar. I'm sorry, it was cut off at the end there. Could you give us some examples of possible applications of what could happen going forward with the metaverse and smart cities. Well, I think in a very near future, there could be great opportunities in the whole world of uh, gaming. There's a talk of gaming of uh, industry of the cities as well as other industries, that is to say, to plan by playing. And we can see how the world of entertainment is ever more connected to cities. There are more and more people who are immersed or in contact with technologies. We also see the way in which cities are designed, including physical cities, brings us a lot of data to better plan the real cities. And so this ends up being a social laboratory because of the ties that are generated as among persons with the exchange of goods and services or business opportunities and professional opportunities. So I think that we are going to have to uh, examine all of these issues that are coming up today as opportunities for sectors such as education, tourism, as Jennifer was mentioning, everything that has to do with the world of entertainment, uh, music, fairs, uh, shows, and so on, everything having to do with digital art, e-commerce, the world of uh, construction or real estate. Well, all of these are epicenters of great opportunities, and we need to be prepared for that. Prepared professionally, and we also need to know how to interact in a responsible and ethical fashion with all of these new opportunities. But I would say, no doubt, there's a huge opportunity in terms of preparing us professionally as well, because new professional demands will be coming down the line and that are going to require new skills. Great, before closing out this segment and very quickly, I would like to put a question to both of you, Jennifer and Lucia. We are talking about a region that has major uh, gaps of inequality. Could you give us a specific example of what benefits will be generated or are already being generated for the most vulnerable uh, populations but through the use of these technologies? Lucia? Well, once again, we see these opportunities in terms of accessibility, being able to access certain services, being able to access certain spaces, being able to get to know cities, everything having to do with jobs, with uh, connecting ourselves much more without barriers of any site, uh, of type, be they geographic, gender, age, language, social sector. So I would say that there, there's also a great opportunity in terms of inclusion, in terms of uh, telework or meta work, many 
jobs can be done remotely. So this makes it such that many of the low income segments or persons who are excluded today can access new jobs. I also think that connectivity is very important and the uh, giving impetus to the metaverse can be a driving force for improving lack of access to internet or the speed of internet in our regions. So I think that this could push us to citizens becoming much more connected and much more globalized. And as a result, I think this could result in more personalized services, uh, be it health, telemedicine, education, and so I think this information that was mentioned by the uh, CEO of the IDB lab mentioned how it, metaverse can help boost GDP 5% throughout the region. So no doubt all of these matters can bring a world of opportunities that we're gonna have to know how best to take advantage of the region because the institutions, the companies, the persons, are extremely open and receptive to the technologies involved in the metaverse. Thank you, Lucia. And the same question for you, Jennifer, what opportunities for the most vulnerable populations? As Lucia already mentioned, the power is in uh, environments such as say, if there's uh, elementary and high schools that don't have laboratories, they just don't have the infrastructure precisely because of where they're located and the economic question itself. Well, bringing about these virtual environments, as we mentioned, maybe a bit more needs to be done in terms of pooling efforts so that the isolated efforts can be, come together and create a much more solid metaverse. But right now, there are already uh, tangible benefits that populations are getting from these uh, virtual laboratories that are open. And they can get in and go in as an av av avatar, have experiences and avoid the risks that one might find in a chemical laboratory, physics laboratory. And now they can do it. Just the, the fact of being able to visit a, f a forensic center. Well, I think we have gained a great deal. We've cut, uh, we've reduced that gap and we see that virtual education can be much more experimental with the use of this technology. Jennifer and Lucia, thank you so much. This takes us to the third part of this event. And we now want to uh, focus more on this call, understand what it is that is expected and what we can get. And we're, for that, we are accompanied by Diana Herbase, who is the Manager for Strategic Partnerships of Meta. And on behalf of the IDB, uh, we're accompanied by Maria Elena Nawad, who is Principal Specialist or Senior Specialist with IDB Lab. Uh, welcome, and I don't know which of you would like to begin by explaining all the details that we should get to know first. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to begin presenting the details of this call. Uh, first, I want to say that we have many people listening through Zoom and Facebook, so I would like to make sure that you all have this email address, it's also at the uh, web page of the call, so that any question you might have about this call when you're filling out your applications, well, any question you may have, please write to us at this email and we're going to answer your questions. So I wanted to get into what we are seeking through this call. This is a call that is very important, both for Meta and for the IDB lab, as has been mentioned, because, well, we have three objectives through this process. First, we want to uh, gain a deeper understanding about how people explore and build metaverse communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. Second, we'd like to identify those communities that are using metaverse technologies to achieve social and economic impacts, especially for low uh, income, uh, sectors and who are doing so in an ethical and responsible manner. These are the topics we've been hearing about in the first part of the session, section, which are so important, or the session, which are so important for both institutions. And third, we want to support a new generation of leaders and creators by training them, 
by uh, coaching and funding and also giving them visibility so as to amplify their impact. These are the objectives that we seek through this call. And once again, why do we want to do that? Be well, uh, this morning, there has already been talk of the great potential of adopting metaverse technologies in economic terms for the whole world and for the region as well. And we want to ensure that that growth is done in an ethical and responsible manner and that it benefits not just a handful of people or one or another segment of the population, but everyone, everyone throughout the region. So as we get to know who is beginning to work in these spaces, from what countries are they? What are their needs and also their challenges? Well, this will help us better target the financing that we can provide for creation of the metaverse and also to target other services that we can provide with any number of allies like Meta. So to give you a bit more detail about what this is all about and what it is that we are seeking through this call, I'm going to give the floor to my uh, colleague, Diana. Thank you, Maria Elena. It's a pleasure to be here with each and every one of you. We are very happy with this call and being able to be here in this information session. Well, begin before beginning and talking about the audience targeted by this program, I do want to say a few words. Uh, this partnership has been very good. Uh, we think about how the metaverse is a construction that will happen with uh, people coming from different angles, uh, companies, academics, governments. And it's so great that we have this opportunity to be here today in this Q&A session and also to be able to highlight the challenges we face, talk about responsibility, security, and inclusion, as you also said, Maria Elena. At Meta, we have four priorities that are very important for responsible innovation in the metaverse, which are privacy, safety or security, economic opportunity, and also uh, inclusion, which is very important. We are committed to participating in construction of the metaverse, being sensitive to the reality of the region, and also to the social challenges entailed by the new technology. So I'm gonna speak a little bit more right now about who this call is directed to or who it's for. We are calling on leaders who are creating or managing communities that are 100% constructed in the metaverse that draw on specific elements of the metaverse or make use of them, or that have a demonstrated interest in the metaverse that are say communities that participate in debates that seek to learn more about the experiences, the technologies, and their applications. I would like to spell out a bit what we mean to by the word community, because we know that it uh, may be interpreted in any number of ways. For us in this call, the word community refers to a group of individuals, that is say the community members who share a common interest and who commit to interacting horizontally to generate value for all. As you can see, it's a very broad concept, and that's on purpose. We want to be as inclusive as possible. The communities that are the focus can be constituted uh, legally or as constituted or not or incorporated. They could also be an informal community online or offline. And so I want to make it very clear that we are opening open to startups, to companies, to groups of individuals who are interconnecting virtually through social networks, content creators, associations, NGOs, affiliates, education centers, among others. All who are beginning to build communities in the metaverse are welcome. And just to also talk about what how we interpret the uh, metaverse, these are uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, situations. Also, the countries 
we are going to be accepting applications or nominations from 24 countries in all, 11 South American countries, seven Central American countries, and also six countries from the Caribbean. The specific selection of these countries has been based on the intersection of the uh, borrower countries from the IDP and also where Meta has operations. I should also note that we're going to be carrying out this program in three languages, English, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese. Great, I think we already have some questions that have come to us from the uh, public. One is a question, why are Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela left out of this initiative? My dear Lena, supplementing what Diana had said, yes. Since this is a, a call that was done together with Meta, we offer financing to all of the countries of the region in the, the bar, who are, that are borrower countries of the bank. And there are some countries where Meta also operates. And so we have joined that presence of ours with the presence of Meta to come up with this list. Great, another question. It says, I don't reside in any Latin American country. Can I still apply? Well, to apply, the leader of the entity or the organization that's the leader of the entity has to be registered or residing in one of these 24 countries. The or organization, yes, if it's an organization because one can apply as an organization or as a leader, but the organization or the individual who's the leader has to have residence. Next uh, overhead, we have some more overheads. I now wanted to explain what are the awards and the two levels of awards that we have uh, for this call. The first one is for what we call challenge participants. The community may qualify for these awards and they, uh, there are four trainings in four relevant uh, teams, uh, topics. First, community building. Since we're talking about building communities, we need to provide training in order to foster and develop your communities. The second is responsible innovation principles. That is to say, we've been talking quite a bit about uh, ethics and responsibility. That is a specific training in that area. Third, metaverse and virtual reality. That is to say, to get to, to, to better know what is that virtual reality technology. And fourth, augmented reality, which is another experience that is applied in the metaverse. So to qualify at this level, your community will have to show interest in the metaverse, or we'll have to show that it's already operating in the metaverse and that it has a community presence, that is to say that it's a community has at least been operating as of September 1st of this year. It also, in terms of size, there should be at least 30 members of the community and evidence of that needs to be shown. And third, the leaders, we're talking about the leaders of the community, the leaders will have to satisfy certain ethical and integrity criteria and the an analysis will be performed there. So if your community meets these criteria, then it, it will have access to these trainings that I just mentioned. Now at the second level, oh, I'm sorry. And the first, we hope that we're going to be able to give awards to more or less 300 participants. If there's more, well, so long as they meet the criteria, they'll be offered access to these trainings. Now, the second level, we are going to select 10 winners. And these 10 winners, what they're going to receive, in addition to training in tier one, they're going to receive $10,000 financing. And this, these funds are to grow and strengthen your community. They're also going to receive eight weeks of business coaching, personalized business coaching, once again, to address those needs that the community has specifically at a one week residency at Meta in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And there 
uh, you'll be able to speak with experts on the topic, receive advisory services, and learn about the latest technologies and applications of the metaverse. In order to, uh, well, the selection criteria at this level are first, you have to show that you're actually generating a social and or economic impact in the region. Once again, that the there's a commitment to connect with the members that you're applying ethical principles, uh, principles of ethics and development, and also that they'd be able to show us how the awards given will be used in order to amplify the impact. And finally, there should be a potential for scaling up. Now I'd like to talk about the timeline so that you can bear these dates very much in mind when you send in your applications. The uh, challenge launch was last Tuesday, October 25th. And uh, the application has two parts. The first part uh, was opened up last uh, 25 October and it's gonna be open until 25 November of this year. Then there's another part. If you meet the criteria of the first part, then you'll be invited to complete the second part of the application. And that second part is open from November 14th until December 9th. And once again, for these two deadlines, there will be no extensions. Then we're going to have a selection process and we're going to announce the winners of tier one in December and the winners of tier two in February of next year. And the awards that we'll be providing at these two levels will be uh, granted or those awards will be made between January and March of next year. And I now give the floor to uh, Diana to talk a little bit more about the details. Thank you, uh, Maria Elena, as Maria Elena has shown you. And the timeline just now, the most important thing is to know that the application process has two parts. The first part is related to selecting those who are going to be called challenge participants. The process will be open until 25 November, and you can do so by gaining access to the application through the QR code that you can see up on the screen. And you can also find that at the link at the IDB Lab website. Part two of the application is for selecting the uh, beneficiaries of the challenge uh, or the challenge grantees. They're going to receive the funds, get the business coaching, and they'll also be invited to the residency. All of those who have been selected in part one will receive an email inviting them to participate in part two of the application process. And the deadline for part two is December 9th. Now, one thing that's important uh, to bear in mind, and which I will repeat, is that we recommend that everyone begin uh, parts, part one and part two of the questionnaire and the application process as soon as possible because uh, no applications were received after the deadlines indicated. And finally, just to say that we are using the UNoodle platform to receive applications. Should you have any doubt, you can send an email to metaverse challenge at pearlconsult.com. This is the email that you can see up on the screen right now. We'll be able to answer any doubt you have on any aspect of the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Some questions have come in. And fortunately, we are now near the closing of this session. But if we have just a couple of questions, a, couple, a few minutes, some of the questions refer to the requirements to be able to participate, especially the concept of community. How do we understand that concept? The fact that there's a representative, a leader, exactly what is needed? Well, as I've said, we want to be as broad as possible. So the concept of community is that it is a group of people that have a common interest and that are interacting in a horizontal way. But this interaction can occur on any platform. It could be a meta platform or not. And it's important to mention that also. And it can also be a community that is mostly offline, but that uses the metaverse somehow. So it is very broad. And as we've said, they should have, uh, they should be together before uh, September and should have at least 
30 members involved. The universe can the universities apply? Yes, this concept applies to them as well. Yes. And now that you've said that it's not necessary to have a profile in Meta, it could be anyone making use of other technologies. Yes, of course. I don't know if there are any other questions that we can answer now. I'm sure that there are many interesting questions that we, well, we've already answered some in the chat, but the communication channels are open, but you just have to remember this important date. Uh, November 25th is the deadline. It's a very important deadline. And I want to thank Marilena, Lucia, Elena, everyone that feels passionate about this as we do. And remember that the objective is to have sustainable development from the metaverse. We'll, we will await your ideas, your initiatives, and we'll see you in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.